This is part three of Mount and Plain. So Mount and Plain, this is Sermon on the Mount. Most people are familiar with that. We should all be at this point familiar with the idea of what the Sermon on the Plain is, which is Luke's version of that. But it may or may not, we're not 100% sure, but it seems like it's actually Christ giving the same message just in another location. Like it kind of seems like he gave the Sermon on the Mount, came down the Mount, and then there's more people, and he gives a similar message sermon just slightly differently. This is the largest single stretch of a sermon that that Christ that is ever recorded. Uh, Now again, I like to clarify this for for all of us because a lot of times we're like recorded and we think like it is exactly like they transcribed his message and that's not the case. It's the spirit, the essence, the idea. No doubt some of these things probably were exact phrasings, right? So for instance, I'm I'm not comparing myself to Jesus in this regard. I'm just using this as an example. If I was to say right now, all scripture is given for spiritual understanding, natural application, right? We all say it the same way because it, it kind of becomes a way we talk, right? No different than things, well, I say phrases that apparently no one else says, but I grew up hearing them like, that really chaps my hide, right? Like, uh, well, yeah, that was just the way I grew up. I grew up out in the country and I was like, man, that really chaps my hide. Maybe that was just the clean Christian version of how to say that, uh, you know, uh, you know, so, uh, or quit being a slow poke, right? These are, these are phrases and slangs and terms that we use all the time, right? Most of y'all don't know where slow poke came from, do you? No. Mike. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, uh, we're not going to go into a little interesting, but you get the, the point, right? So these phrases, these ideas and, and things were more than likely most of them phrases that he used, just maybe slightly differently. You'll notice that like Luke says it slightly differently than Matthew. But at the end of the day, right, if you're saying something ticks you off or chaps your hide or upsets you, you're saying the same thing. You're just saying it in different ways, right? We see that. Uh, and that's actually a good thing because that lets us know something. That lets us know that... As Christ was communicating, we can learn this from the way Christ communicates. He took into account who he was talking to to make sure that the message got where it needed to go, right? And so we see that when he talks to different people, he speaks kind of in different ways. Same message, he just kind of represents it slightly differently to hit at home where it needs to for these individuals, right? And we see that with, with Paul and with lots of the other disciples. So where we're at right now is, you know, the, when we first started, we were mostly in Matthew, and we looked at what Luke had to say about it. And then we swapped over to Luke last week, and we read a few verses in Luke and kind of saw where Matthew kind of talks about the same thing. But we're not quite done with Luke yet. So tonight, we're going to go through the rest of what Luke had to say. Hopefully, <laughs> we'll get through it all. Um, it, it, it's, it's a lot, but not much all at the same time. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll go through that, and then next week we'll come back for sure for a part four, because then we're going to cover all of the rest, hopefully, of Matthew. It may take us two sessions to do that. Um, but by doing this, we, we want to give this a lot of thought, because there's a lot you're going to notice. You probably already have as we're reading. It's like, oh, I knew that part. I knew that. Script. Like You've heard these things, but didn't know they were all compiled in one idea. Now, as we do this, this is going to continue to build upon where we're headed with all of this. Now, you may, most of you are saying, well, aren't we just headed to read it all? But you're actually going to notice kind of a path of the teachings of Christ and the actions of Christ that get exceedingly more and more and more direct, more and more. And you'll, you'll notice he goes from kingdom of God at hand. It's right here. It's right now. That's his main message. And then you'll notice he kind of expounds upon it and expounds upon it and gives us more information and more information. So as we keep going, that's what we're going to see. And as we keep going, it's going to build us up in a couple of weeks, guys. We're going we're gonna to get to a parable, which is the longest parable really ever recorded. Um, with it, and it's the most popular. And when we get to that parable, you're going to see kind of everything just packed into one simple little story. And it's really cool. Uh, and it's really cool because <laughs> Jesus directly tells us all the answers, right? So he wasn't trying to speak in parables to confuse people. He turned around and told you this is what it's like. So let's continue on where we just left off of from uh, last week was in verse 36. Uh, so, sorry, uh, chapter, Luke chapter 6, verse 36, and what that ends with is saying, so be merciful as God is merciful. So if you're like, I don't remember what all came before that, we've got the whole session. You just go back and watch it. There's 
18 pages of notes. Go back and, and, and look at that. Now we're going to jump in right here. This is a pretty popular passage. I'm going to be switching between screens here. So like here's the notes that you can pull up, right? And then I'm going to show you scripture as well. We're going to flip back and forth a little bit from that. But you'll notice in your notes now as well, I've just went ahead and put the verses directly in the notes so you can read them and just kind of study through it on your own time and make it a little easier. So, y'all ready? Luke chapter 6, verse 37, judge not, and you will not be judged, or lest you be judged if it's King James. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Who's ever heard this? Um, this? this is super popular um, for other Christians to quote to other Christians all the time uh, when one disapproves of what the other one is doing. And see, Jesus knew that this was going to happen, because as we read, he gives us the answer to that as well. So let's just kind of read it. And then we'll go back and define some of these things. So right here in verse uh, 37, judge not, and th- I'm swapping back to the King James because uh, I just have always read King James. There's nothing wrong with the ESV. I put the ESV in your notes. It's a little easier to read. I'm just a King James guy, you know, because my dad will whip me if I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So, judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it will be given unto you. And anyone who has went to church in the 90s will know this, because this was the offering verse. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. And when you get to heaven, you won't need anything from no man. So it's here and now. They'll give to you. Yeah, see, that's how we preach, right? Y'all thought all the Pentecostal was gone on Sunday? No. No. For with the same measure that you give, with all measure will be given to you again. (laughs) My dad would be so proud. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) If you want to know the key to preach like that, all you got to do is add a ha at the end of it. And then it gets going. Yeah, see? All right, back in the spirit. I know, but I'll get water damage in my computer. (laughs) That's really why they stopped preaching like that. They didn't want to damage computers in the new age. (laughs) So let's read. So good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. With the same measure that you meet, or with all that you give, the same measure will be to you again, or given to you again. Verse 39, and he spoke a parable unto them. So right in the middle of this, he's sharing this, and he gives us another little parable. He says, can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? Verse 40. And the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Verse 41. And why beholds thou the mote or the speck in your brother's eye when you perceive not the beam or the log, is another way of phrasing that, in your own eye? Verse 42. Either how shall you say to your brother, let me pull out that speck or mote in your eye, when you yourself cannot behold the beam in your own? You hypocrite. (laughs) Don't you just love how Jesus just just slaps it, right? Cast the beam out of your eye first, and then you shall see clearly to pull out the mote in your brother's eye. In verse 43, for a good tree brings forth not corrupt fruit, neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his fruit. And for of the thorns, men do not gather figs, nor of the brush uh, or, or in the bush um, gather they grapes. Now we'll kind of stop right. Well, let's just go ahead and keep reading. Verse 45, and a good man from the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of, of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For, the abundance of, for with the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <laughs> and then look at this. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? And now we should know what's coming up next because he says, Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I will show you whom he is like, for he is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Now, we've already studied that one in quite depth. So do you see where we fall into? And that's kind of the end of Luke, where his message, this is kind of the end up, and he wraps it up with a wise man, foolish man, building house on the rock and the sand. Like I said, refer back to the other sessions. We did two sessions on those, uh, that particular idea of wise and foolish. Okay, so now let's kind of back up and see what's happening here. One of the things we can see what's happening here is Jesus already knew that people were going to be judging each other. He says, don't do that. And then he goes on to say, here's some reasons why you shouldn't do that. <laughs> but we need to kind of understand a little bit more fullness of this, in my view. 
There's a couple of things. Let's swap back over here. There's a couple of things just first in concept when we think about this. We need to think about who he's talking to, right? See, by use of the term going to your brother is inferring that you are both children of the same. If you look at the word brother, it means begotten of the same father or mother, so of the same family. You'll notice this trend as we continue to read this idea. It's in the Old Testament and the New Testament of you'll be called the sons of God, meaning begotten of God. So this idea of going to your brother is within the body of believers. (laughs) So there's actually not going to be a scripture that you're going to be able to point out to me that fully describes and tells you to go point out to a sinner their sin. Do you know that? Scripture says they already know it. And it says actually by you living your life in the way that God says, it points it out even more to them. (laughs) And it says that then they end up basically kind of coming to you and saying, hey, I need some help with this. Who it does say that we're supposed to assist with this is our brothers and sisters. But doesn't that seem kind of contradictory? It says don't judge and don't condemn and don't do these things. So how are we supposed to help our brother and sister? Because doesn't he turn right back around later on and say, so remove this beam from your eye and then, then you can help your brother and sister. So doesn't it, who would be honest? It's like you're saying don't do it in verse 37. And then like in verse 40 and 41, you're saying hey, once you kind of clean your act up, then you can go do it. And this is the stance that the church takes. The church takes the stance as a whole, we, all of us, take the stance as a whole that when you've arrived at some arbitrary level of goodness, then you get to go tell somebody else all their faults. And we kind of laugh about it, but that's exactly what we do. We'll even do it within like a specific idea, right? Like, well, I can point this out for them because I don't struggle with that. And I don't see that, by the way, here at all or anywhere else in Scripture. So we have to kind of stop and think like this is actually a a widely used verse to justify anything we want to (laughs) do. If we don't want someone to say anything to us, judge not lest you be judged. And then if we want to say something to somebody, we say, I've already removed the beam out of my eye. Now I'm removing the beam out of yours. Do we not? And I would like to point out to you that that is a wicked twisting of Scripture to fit your own benefits. So, and then let's, just real quick, let's also talk about this good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. And yeah, that sounds like a disclaimer, right? Like at, at the end of the uh, at the end of the offering time in church, they're like, a "Good measure, first time, second, we're running over." Like, <laughs> but let's talk about this because I'm about to tick some people off. Because financial anything of this world mentioning in here is only mentioned one time, way at the beginning. If you notice, everything that led up to this from our last message is all about things about forgiving people and, get, and, and getting forgiveness and, 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 and giving people grace and mercy, and you'll receive the grace and mercy. It all has to do with a spiritual idea. So while, while, let me get that a little less text in here, while, <laughs> while can it apply, right? Can it apply to financial giving or giving of items and things? Sure. I mean, yes, God does want you to have a good life, but his version of good, not yours. And good life does not mean your personal comfort. So we've got to add all that into the little equation we want to give. Um, and then also realize that this particular text is not primarily talking about that. You're going to be... Uh, very displeased if you like to equate a lot of the things Jesus said to your financial or physical gain in this world, and you want to apply things to that. Can I let the cat out of the bag, Albie? I'm going to real quick. Who's also heard about the four good grounds in the parable of the sower? We're going to be talking about that pretty soon. And who's also heard that as a a sowing thing, right? Oh, it's good ground, and sowing good ground, and my ministry is good ground. Now, I'm poking fun, but at the same time, that's how it's used. And that scripture, nothing to do. The ground is your own heart. The seed is the words of God. Now, again, can it work? Sure. 
But that is not the purpose of it. And if you don't know the purpose of a thing, misuse is inevitable. So if we don't know the purpose of the words of Christ and the purpose of why he said these things, we will misuse them and then we'll wonder why it ain't working and it's because you're trying to use a wrench as a hammer. That's, that's just a, a, a little breath for us all. So let's talk about this judge not and you will not be judged, condemn not and you will not be condemned, forgive and you will be forgiven. Now, you notice he says there's two things you don't do, and then there's one thing you do do. And then he also goes on um, right up here. <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> and then it, he gives us another one. Given it will be given unto you. Now, keep in mind, when Scripture was originally written, it did not have chapters and verses. Okay? No chapters and verses. We added those in to help us, when we're all sitting in a place like this, to say, where are we reading from? And could, if you could imagine just a ridiculous amount of scrolls and you all brought your own little wagon of scrolls because that's what this would be. And I'm like, we're going to read from this one. <laughs> now, well, give everybody an hour to find the one that I'm... We're looking for the one that says this, right? So we added chapters and verses to help it ease. But sometimes that makes us think they're different thoughts. But this is not a different thought. Who remembers from our hermeneutics class of the study guide about something called parallelism? This is a parallelism. Judge not, you will not be judged. Condemn not, you will not be condemned. Give, it will be given. Right? Forgive, it will be forgiven. Give, it will be given. So it's a, it's a parallel. Here's two things not, here's two things too. But they pair. So the word judge, the first word judge, it actually means this idea of to distinguish between something primarily for approval. See, we think judge like condemnation. That's the next one. That's the word condemned. But this one means like, yes, it has a condemn and a punishment idea in the Greek language. But the primary, so we have to always understand words have multiple meanings. And it has to do with where you use it, which one it's going to mean. And so it's a little bit of an interesting play here that it's judge not, you won't be judged, condemned not. So he's flipping it. What we're seeing here is a primary first, judge meaning do not distinguish and approve something that should not be approved. And then he turns around and says, and don't condemn things, don't call judgment upon somebody, meaning like don't now say you're condemned and you're shut down. This is the idea of, of condemnation. It also means to say now you're guilty of something. So don't approve someone of something and don't call someone guilty of something. Why? Because you're not supposed to be the one doing that. See, so we miss it. We just say, judge not, condemn not. Oh, okay, so judge is like, you know, just don't, don't observe it. That's, uh, we kind of we kinda act like observing an issue is like judging someone, and that's, that's not the case at all, right? I mean, for instance, if I observe a train about to hit somebody, I am not responsible for the train hitting somebody. I am not in any way, I just saw it. I'm recognizing that it is there, Right? But if I approve and say, no, they're good to stay, and that train will stop, now what have I done? I've approved what that person's doing, and now it causes destruction. Or the same thing, do I condemn that person and say, you know, I don't know, the train track idea is probably a bad idea because you should get someone off a train track. But, you know, <laughs> but do, nor do I condemn them and call them an idiot and say, why were you ever standing on a train track, you know, or whatever like that, right? So this idea is a, is a dual back and forth idea. I find it interesting, and I was sharing this earlier today, Sharing with Sharon. That's going to be our next show. We're going to have Arden Albie and Sharing with Sharon in a minute with Mimi. We're just going to have all the way, 60 seconds, Mimi, recap, everything. <laughs> so what we see is an interesting correlation that most of us don't pick up. Remember, Jesus is trying to get us to understand one simple but profound idea all the way from the beginning. What was the tree we were not supposed to partake of? The knowledge, the understanding, the decision-making between good approval things and evil non-approval things, things that are not good. Who was supposed to be the one doing that? God. So Jesus was not down, nor his disciples. This is a direct callback and saying, do not call things approved. And I'm just going to go ahead and do it because y'all are all here and y'all can get ticked and I don't really care. Um, <laughs> I care about your immortal souls. Uh, <laughs> but... 
do not approve certain things because that make that you calling something good that I didn't call good can also create equal destruction. And you saying something is bad that I didn't say is bad can do the same thing. Can anybody help me out real quick about things like religion does? We'll turn to somebody and say, this particular thing in life, whatever it is, and I'll just use one that's a little less contested because, or maybe super contested. Let's just use smoking, okay? Let's just use smoking, okay? You turn around and you approve smoking for one person and then you, you condemn it for this person. You got a group of Christians saying you're going to hell for smoking. You got a group of Christians over here saying, no, you're not going to go to hell for smoking. Who's supposed to be the one that determines that? The Spirit of God within the person because there could be someone over here that smoking gets them down a really bad path that they end up tied up in a whole other thing of addiction and you just stood up and said, do it. It's perfectly fine. And they're like, well, God's cool with this. Now, God's cool with this or not is irrelevant to the fact of what the Spirit of God is leading them in. Nor, so that's the approval side, nor should you condemn it because this person's like, oh, I thought I was kind of getting closer to God, you know. I heard a guy, <laughs> I don't know if y'all know who Matt Chandler is. He's uh, up north from here. Um, he's actually a fantastic speaker, uh, and not like speaker as far as inspiration, like biblical teacher uh, as, as a whole. I agree with most of, of what he says. But he was in a, it was like a leadership thing that he was talking about. He was talking about someone in the church that, you know, they're smoking on the front porch of the church. And he said, yeah. And, you know, three weeks ago they were doing meth. This is good. Like, they've gotten away, you know. And so we've got to sometimes take this idea, and that's what he's trying to say here. Don't start to try to approve things. Don't try to be what the Spirit of God is supposed to be in a man's heart. Let him be the one that leads and guides. But what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? So here's the two things not to do. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. This is, this is the idea. Now, again, am I saying that when they said this, that they were saying, now think about Genesis, everybody in that No, it's the idea. It's the same concept because constantly it's trying to get us to understand this idea. That's why we call it faith, trust. Because to trust God is to say, I let him be the arbiter of good and evil. And even though I don't deem this as good, uh, God is saying it's good. <laughs> okay? Y'all seeing this, Okay. So that's that. But what are we supposed to do? Forgive. Let, just real quick, why are we having to forgive people if they haven't transgressed us? Because you're going to be transgressed. People are going to do things to you. And the idea is that you're supposed to now forgive them. And, and you're supposed to forgive them because they could be approving something in their lives that you are denied in yours. And then you're going to want to judge them and say, well, if I can't do it, you can't do it. But God may not have told them not to do it. Or moreover, God may have told them to do something that you wish God had told you to do. See, we always like to do the don't do's. But how about when we start getting jealous of something that someone's, God's called someone else to do? And we're looking at, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. And we're asking, and we're like, why does it look like everything works for them? But they're paying prices you ain't aware of. And you start to judge what God is doing well in their lives all the while because, see, you're not doing what God told you to do. And he would, he would equally make it look easy for you, too. He didn't say it would be. just it may look that way. <laughs> He may lead you in a path. So why, why are we supposed to forgive? Because we're going to need some forgiveness ourselves. And so this idea of forgiveness is saying, what, what is forgiving? Guys, it's, it's pretty simple. Forgiving is actually the only approval you get to do. I love my dad's definition. I'm a redneck sometimes, guys. Forgiveness. I am for giving you another chance. Right? I'm sure someone else has said it, but I heard it from my dad, so I thought he was super smart when he said it. <laughs> I am for it. Now, I like to shift it because another chance means you're on strike two, and I still remember, and that's not quite fully. So I like a new beginning, which is, after all, what God said he did for us. Resurrection, complete new beginning, born again, Nicodemus, right? So I like to say, forgiveness. I'm for giving you a new start. Let's fresh start. It's a new one. And so that's what I'm for. Notice it's a thing that you are approving of this person to do. It's the only approval you get to do, to approve someone to hurt you again. Yeah, I know we don't like that, but that's what it, you get to approve and say, here I am. <laughs> Crucify me. Here I am. I'm going to let you. It's almost like when Jesus went to the cross before he went, he was beaten a whole, whole lot. And I know, yes, we're going to read about wounded for our transgressions. That's actually a super interesting little phrasing that is used there. But the idea is that we can approve to say, I'm, I'm here. Because, see, I'm not going to be my own shield. 
I'm going to let God be my shield in this. And I'm going to look at you as the image bearer of God, and I'm not going to judge the fact that the grace I expect from God and I expect other people to give me that I don't want to give to you, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, because freely it's been given, so freely I, I give. Now, what is, what is the giving side? So forgiving is the approval side. Giving is, is you're not going to deny. <laughs> so you notice you don't ever get to deny. It ain't your job, except for yourself. That's the only denying you get to do, is to yourself. This idea of giving is to relinquish complete control of, which, boy, do we have a hard time with that. <laughs> I, I, I know some people that everything is with the strings attached. Y'all ever had, had that? Everything, strings attached. They say, no, 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 and, but there's always that little, you know, someday they're going to call it due. You know, you know what I mean? And giving is not that at all. And see, again, if we, we can, apply, can, can this apply to natural things and giving of, of things to the church or to other people? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. But that string's attached to your forgiveness, that string's attached to the grace and the mercy, that's saying, yeah, 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 I, I'll be here again. But if you cross this line, I'm not going to give it. And then what does it say? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto you. What are they going to give? Uh, not judgment, not condemnation. They're going to be giving you forgiveness. They're going to be giving you things like, I don't know, as we move up here. Uh, oh, y'all can see it. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> up here, like the love and, and those types of things and, and, and not being un- unthankful. And, 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 and this whole thing really has to do a whole, whole lot with love right here in this particular area. It's almost like it's super important uh, or something. We'll find out. I don't know. Do y'all know the answer to that one? Not, not sure. But see, we get right back into these, these woes. And, and by the way, do any of these have to do with natural things? Blessed is the person with it. No, this is all spiritual concepts as well. So this entire passage, other than one little area, is it talking about a natural giving and receiving idea. This entire thing is a spiritual giving and receiving. Now, let's continue on. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Now, let's talk about this parable right here real quick. And I know Sundays are, are, are parable days. But what I want to talk about real quick is this idea of the blind leading the blind and the speck in your brother's eye. Now, again, super popular. Who's ever heard this? People that don't even know the Bible quote this kind of stuff all the time, right? Like, we, we use this all the time, right? Can, can someone, don't, you can't take someone somewhere you've never been before, right? We, we, we use these phrases all the time and no one even knowing that it's actually inspired by scripture uh, to say these things. Uh, but let's, let's, let's think about this for a minute. Let's just read it again. And now let's look at what we're talking about here. Can the blind lead the blind? No, they're both going to fall into a ditch. And again, I'll just quote some good old Thompson sayings. You know what a ditch is? It's a grave with both ends kicked out and you just stay in it. (laughs) So you're both going to fall into this. Why does he say that immediately after what we just read? Showing why you are in no position to do any of those judgment calls of good or bad. See, we're always, we always like, well, don't, don't call that no, good or bad. You're not in a position because you're blind, dull of hearing. Remember all these other verses we were talking about? You, you see, but you don't perceive. He's saying you're not in a position to understand this because <laughs> you're both going to lead each other into death, chaos, and destruction. Now, can we be honest? It's probably good. I mean, you are in the church. That's one reason. Number two, you're supposed to be like Christ, and he was pretty honest, uh, pretty brutally honest from my account right now. What do we see happening with our faith? And I don't care about other people's faith. I don't care about all the other world religions. I care about the one that I am a part of. (laughs) What do we see? Death, chaos, destruction from the very thing that's supposed to bring life. Why? Because we have set ourselves up again as the arbiters of good and evil, but not perceiving anything about it. And he says, you're not in a position to do these things because you're both leading each other right into it. And, 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 and so you notice, can blind lead the blind? There's no distinction of how blind. <laughs> it didn't say, did a partially blind person that needed some spectacles can, can they lead a completely blind person? It just says, blind is blind. You, you, as far as God concerns, you're both equally blind. Because you both end up in this place. Now, is a disciple above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Now, we need to, to just 
to decipher this a little bit. So what is this simply meaning right here? Let me scroll up just a little bit more. Right here. Okay. What is this simply meaning right here? A disciple is not above his teacher, meaning one who is needing to be taught is not above the one doing the teaching, right? Guys, this is pretty simple. Who does Jesus say the teacher is? No. He says God. When people actually came to him and said, good teacher, he said, hey, 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 hey. What I'm doing and saying is, is God. Directly. Through me, yes. But don't look at me as the teacher. Why? Because Jesus already knew something they didn't know. You're about to have the teacher right there. Like, so, so make sure you're looking at that teacher. I am the expression of it. Right here, right now. Observe because you need to do it just like I'm doing it right now. So the one who needs teaching, the teacher, why? Because you have the Spirit of God. See, one of the things we also don't understand is everything Jesus was saying is as if it's already happened. We would call that like a version of prophecy. <laughs> Can we have some fun real quick? I want to. Because he is the Spirit of God on earth. He kind of already knows. <laughs> this is not complicated. <laughs> like, so he's going to speak to everything as if it already is. It's almost like we have a lot of other scriptures that say something like that. So he says a, 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 a student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is perfect will be like his teacher. Now, we think perfect, you never mess up. But I want you to look at this. The word perfect literally means to be complete, thoroughly repaired, or adjusted, fit, frame and mended, restored. Now, does anybody else get that? <laughs> when, you, when we see the word perfect, now we have to understand this. This is not a mistranslation. This is the English language has changed. Because, see, the word perfect for us now means, like, completely perfect, no issues with it, right? But back then, the word perfect in English even meant more of this idea, this idea of being completed, uh, be, being, being finished, and I love it's repaired and adjusted. Guys, what needed to be repaired and adjusted? The relationship in Genesis, righteousness needed to be restored in direct relationship so that we could be completed, fit back in a framework that God originally intended. So he's saying, student, you're not above the teacher. You're not above the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God is going to be the one approving and denying and doing these things. Your job is to be as the Spirit is, has already done to you with the forgiveness, with the completely relinquishing of control. See, and, <laughs> see, because God also did that at the beginning. He relinquished control of something, his creation to man, and watched it go up in flames. <laughs> see, y'all didn't think that. See, God was the first giver. <laughs> And he relinquished the control. He said, now, do it like I did it. And he's like, and you're going to, okay. You know? Do, do we see this? So he who is repaired, then you'll be like, then you'll be like that teacher. And it didn't say you were the teacher either, did it? It just said you're like him. <laughs> Almost like an image bearer, which is also mentioned in Genesis 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 and you'll be my image bearers. So now you'll be like him. Didn't say you get to go around being him. <laughs> so then it says, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye and do not notice the log or the, the beam, depending on you know, if you're reading King James or not, in your own? Notice this. It didn't say, and the phrasing is important here because this is the idea that Luke's trying to get across to us. This is also mentioned in Matthew, by the way. It didn't say, there's no speck in your brother's eye, but there is one in yours. It didn't say there's a speck in your eye. It says, why do you notice that, but you can't notice yours? So this is really less of a, see, we want to look at it as there's a speck and there's a log. Let's see what happens here. But the question is actually, why are you observing it that way? The question is not, what is it? It's, why is it happening? And we've missed that. We have missed the why question right here. See, Jesus is asking, why is it this way? Why do we perceive it this way? 
and not perceive it within ourselves. And how, well, how did you go on to that? How can you say to your brother? Again, this is a question. Why? How? Not what? He's saying, how can you say to your brother? How could you do it this way? To remove this speck out of, out of his eye when you yourself have not even observed this beam in your eye. You're a hypocrite. So he, what he's calling out here is the idea that how, I, how could you, how, why do you do it this way? Because it's not the way it should be done. And then how can you go and say that whenever you cannot even see clearly? Because <laughs> you're not like the teacher yet. <laughs> You see, your understanding, I know, I know yeah, some of you are like, well, what's the big deal about the why? Why is it happening that way? Because what he's pointing out is a heart motive. Why? Why? It's, it's, you notice everything Jesus does is turns you back into, and he says, now evaluate where you are in your heart with me. I just want you to look at me. So quit putting it elsewhere. We think this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, is like I'm going to find the deer in the headlights and catch somebody. And that's not the purpose. So he says, why? Because you can't see the beam in your own. Hypocrite. What is a hypocrite? We, we know this one pretty easy. You do one thing, you say another. But moreover, it's not just you do and say, but it's the idea of what you are professing is not what's actually in there. It's not actually in the heart. It's, it's, it's surface level. It's superficial this idea. So it's not just saying don't do, it's this idea of superficial surface level. Strings attached. And he says, so first take, and this is where we get to, we're like, this is our license, this is where we get to do it. First take the log out of your eye. Done. And now you will see clearly to take the moat that is in your brother's eye. Now we're going to talk about two things. Number one, we're going to talk about this, this uh, idea of, of clearly. And then we're going to talk about the idea of the phrasing that's happening here in the, in the language and the time that, that he's talking about. Now, one of the things I'd like to, to point out is this word moat or, or, or speck. One of the primary ideas of it is actually uh, like a small straw or something, something very small, specifically like chaff. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been around a lot of grain in any, of any kind, but I, I, when we used to have horses, we would buy uh, these huge bags of oats, right? And when I say huge bags, they were as big as this stage, like you had to pick them up with a forklift, because we had like 20-something horses and, and about 15 head of cattle, and so that, we bought these oats, and we bought these alfalfa pellets, you may not know what I'm talking about, but imagine, literally, it's like a ton, it's like a one-ton bag, white bag. And it had this thing at the bottom of it that you literally just kind of untied and opened it up and just, and then you shut it. And we'd fill up 55-gallon drums and take it. You know what I hated the most was that? Because if it was windy, <laughs> this white powder, and it was not cocaine, <laughs> just comes off of it, and it gets in your eyes, <laughs> and you can't see clearly. Moreover, I've also had <laughs> something quite large in my eye before. And you know what happens when you take something out that's large in your eye as well? You can't, still can't see. <laughs> see, th th this is the little part of the, the play, play here that's happening. And, the, and, and the, the idea behind this is that, yes, if you, take, if you examine yourself and take it out, you are all the better for it. Then you could potentially go and help your brother. But the issue is, is you still got some healing to do. <laughs> And so this is a whole undercurrent that he's giving us here, and we'll see this as we continue on with it. He's not actually giving you a license to say, now go, now you pulled it out. Just go start. <laughs> I see this wrong with Shalina, and I see this wrong with Wally, and I see this wrong because I already corrected the, the big thing in my life. Oh, I got lots of specks in my eye too. See, we, we take that as like, you remove the log, now I have nothing in my eye, now I am the teacher. No, remember he said, you're like the teacher. Now you're getting rid of the, the obvious things. <laughs> But you still got chaff in your eye. You still need the teacher to lead and guide you. You got some healing to do in the process of it. And if you look at the word clearly, it means fully recovered vision. But I love this. It means to stare straight before one. Pray do tell who are you supposed to stare straight at. The teacher. 
So the idea is now you can more clearly see the teacher who was the original giver, and now when you can clearly see that, you just start to emulate him, which does the forgiving things and all of that. Do you see how this is just... Jesus is quite brilliant, okay? And the disciples were quite brilliant to write it in the way they did. And so we want to take all these things and act like they're trying to give us these new laws and understandings about how to do this, how to do this. Is some of that in the Bible? Absolutely. There's instructions. Like Paul gives us a lot of ways of like how the church can work and stuff. And we're not saying that that, but all of that is to get us back to make sure we remember this. And so the message of Jesus is a very, very straightforward, looking clear in the face. Clear. Is that why you were doing that, Jonathan? I can hear you. (laughs) Clear in the face. It's one simple idea. And he goes around it. And this is what I I used this example just the other day. And I think it was great when there was a van setting, or let's just use the drums setting right there. Right? And if it was pitch black in this room and we all had flashlights, right? And I'm standing here, and someone is standing there, and I'm shining my light, and I'm like, yeah, so there's like a bunch of cables coming out, and there's, and I'm describing this piece here, and some of you right now are like, what is he talking about? Because you're not standing from my perspective here, right? And so what Jesus constantly did, he's like, I am the light, and I'm just going to walk around to where you can all understand this one central concept, and I'll illuminate it from every possible angle to where the whole thing is lit up, to where you get it. We saw that on Sunday. He just gave example after example after example. And some of us were just like, okay, we get it, but we don't. So he's saying now, when you'll see clearly, you'll stare right in the face and you'll, I'm I'm just telling you. I've never stared, stared. I have never stared straight into the face of God. And scripture tells us if 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 you could even, you just, like, you, just, you can't contain it. Moses asked to, uh, and, and God mooned him and just said, I'll show you my backside. Like, that's it. That's all you get to see. Sorry. Sometimes I say things, guys. <laughs> so then you'll be able to clearly see and what does it say now? Yes, now the chaff can be removed from your brother's eye. But <laughs> this is just me, guys, okay? I'm, I'm breaking a little bit from Scripture, but I'm using my own experience. How do you get chaff out of your eye? Water and wind. It's the only two ways. You've got to rinse that out with water, or sometimes you just, what, what do you got to do? You just, you got to do like that and let, let, to get it out of your eye. Spirit is referred to as wind and water, which means the only thing you can remove this speck out of your brother's eye with is not with your abilities, not with your judgments, but with simply with the Spirit of God being the one that does it. You can't do it. It's almost like we just keep getting back to the one thing. And then he goes on to this idea right here. I got some time. Oh, we're making good time tonight. For a good tree brings forth... Wait, wait, wait. Why are we talking about trees all of a sudden now? Right? See, one of the things we have to understand is a lot of the examples used would have been commonplace to them. For us, if we don't deal in planting and trees and fruit and stuff like that, for us it's a little bit kind of off. You know, It's like, well, this, there could have been a better example. Not at the day and time. We may have better modern examples now, but I don't really know that you could get a better one than this because we still eat fruit. So a, a good tree brings forth not corrupt fruit, neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So let's look at this good tree, good fruit thing. We've defined the word good. This is the same word good that's arrived pretty much everywhere else. And then If we look at this word, uh, oh, I haven't read the next verse. Let me read the next verse, because then it's the same one, right? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man brings forth evil of his heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Again, Jesus just hit it with some knowledge. This is like mic drop stuff. And what is he doing? Another parallel, real quick, before we define. So what is he saying? A tree... 
is known by the fruits. No other man gathered from. Oh, I didn't scroll up enough. Sorry. I can see more on my screen here for some reason. Can y'all see? Yes, there we go. Okay. But a, a good tree does not bring forth corrupt. So, all right, we got a tree that's good. It doesn't do corrupt things. Nor does a corrupt tree do good things. Okay. For every tree is known by its fruit, so you know what a tree is. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Like you walk outside to a tree, it has a fruit. <laughs> People could learn this today, just like if it's got that fruit, that's what it is. It doesn't decide to be something different. But let's leave that alone. Uh, <laughs> For it's known by the fruits, nor the thorns do you gather figs. So you can't go to a thorn bush and get a fig from it. (laughs) Nor from the brush can you get grapes, right? Because grapes come from a grapevine. Okay, not not grapevine, Texas. So now what does he say? A good man from the good treasure of his heart. What is he doing? He's saying, okay, so you understand this about a tree and how a tree works. You are the tree. So he's giving us a parallel, saying here's the example in the life that you would understand, and now here you are. You, a good man, the one that is of the quality that God desires, from the treasure. And guys, if you remember Sunday, we talked about this idea of this man who had a field, and and he, he, he saw the field, and there was a treasure in the field, and he took the treasure, he sold everything he had, he buried it right before he goes sells everything he has and he goes back and obtains the field only why bury the treasure it's almost like the treasure is like the seed idea and like if it's in there it doesn't get up, uprooted easily it doesn't get taken away it, it'll actually grow it'll produce something like fruit like there's this thing called the fruit of the spirit that we're going to talk about so he says, like, like this tree, what, has, what does a tree have to do to ever grow in the first place? It has to be planted, has to be put into the ground, has to be covered up, and it has to be watered, and it has, the, all of this stuff has to happen. And then it finally, like my wife, we have a peach tree in our backyard, and it's like this big. <laughs> Which means like when I die, it may produce uh, a, a peach, right? It takes, I don't know, what is it, seven years, Sonia, or something like that? It's a long time for a peach tree. No, ours is already, like, we know that part. Uh, <laughs> we bought one specifically that they bred to say it will produce fruit. So, uh, <laughs> and we actually do. She planted a bunch of them, and I think the lawnmower guys just ran over them. But <laughs> we'll find that out. Uh, <laughs> so so what, is, what is this idea? It has to be planted. Then it has to grow for a while, for a long time, and then it produces fruit. Okay? And if it's good, it will produce good. If it's not, it won't produce anything. And you'll know it. You'll know the types. And so he says, you as a man need to be like this tree. And the treasure, the seed, the thing that is, first off, the thing that you obtained. So let's just think about that for a minute. So if the man didn't sell all he had to obtain that, he wouldn't have that treasure. He'd have this other treasure, which is almost like the world and the kingdom of God, right? Okay. So you're going to have one. And whatever... That treasure is, if it is good, which God is good, so if it is God, that's what's going to come out, and it will bring forth good. But if it's evil, and that word evil is the same word evil that I say I love all the time, which is the word paneros, which means full of labors, annoyances, and toils. So not like bad in nature, bad in content, evil like full of labors, annoyances, and toils. That, and look, it says it's a treasure too, because it is something near and dear. Y'all ever heard the phrase, just think about this, in context of the script, misery loves company. We love evil. The most selling things are dramas. We just love labor, annoyance, toils, chaos. Just the more of it we can have, the more fulfilled life is. See, the irony is we say that, and no offense, I'm not, I'm not being, but I'm like, we, we say that, but we equally turn around and all we want to do is talk about all the other things that have happened. Did you hear about this? Did you hear about this? And about the news? Why? You want to know why? This is my opinion. Why? Because the more we keep our mouth running and looking at other things, we never stop and have to evaluate this thing because we just keep looking at the other things. 
<laughs> we just constantly are like, oh, what about that? Oh, look at that thing. Oh, did you? And, and I'm not being insensitive, but it's going to sound that way. Look at this mass shooting that happened over here. Look at this thing over here. Okay, cool. That's sad. No doubt. But let's look right here because let's prevent things by bringing the Spirit of God to them in our own area instead of just worrying about whatever's going on elsewhere. Because the more we do all that, the less we know what's going on here, which means the less we know what the treasure is. But then all of a sudden we start saying things and we quickly find out what the treasure is. That's why we're consumed with labors, annoyances, and toils, right? Because if you ever slow down, I've watched a show which you probably will condemn me for, but you're not supposed to remember. <laughs> and it's called The Peaky Blinders. The Peaky Blinders is on Netflix. Uh, advisory warning don't have your kids around. Uh, it, it's it's about uh, the actual the razor gang of <laughs> of the uh, of like the, the the early 1900s and things. They were called the Peaky Blinders because they put razors in their hats, and if you took them off and crossed them, and they would literally cut your eyes, and like you couldn't see anymore. So they're called the Peaky Blinders, <laughs> and it's a TV show made of it. I was, the only reason I'm telling you about it is because in the show, the whole premise of the show is about this one guy, and he's a pretty bad dude, uh, but like with some good intentions, but it, it gets, by the way, spoiler alert if you haven't watched it, it gets to the point where it literally he discovers that if he, if he just stops doing all this stuff, then all of it catches up with him, but if he just keeps doing things and doesn't think about it, he has no guilt about it. <laughs> like, that's the premise of this show. This is the world perfectly showing, like, the premise of it is, is the second that he tries to clean up his act, he makes, he, he has to come to himself and start realizing everything he has created and done, and so he says, well, the better option is just keep going with it, and that is the mentality that we have, whether we know it or not, because if we don't stop, we won't evaluate, we won't let the Spirit of God deal with us about it, we won't remove the beam, and so he says, a good man, the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, the evil full of labors, annoyances, and toils, then that, and then what does he say? For the abundance of the heart, meaning what's piled up, that treasure, the thing that you hold most dear, that's what will come out of your mouth. Now, again, religion and what man will tell you is, so fix your mouth. It's impossible. <laughs> Literally, other scriptures and Proverbs and everywhere else says, no man can tame the tongue. That doesn't mean like, oh, well, I just do and say. No, it says, why can't you tame the tongue? Because it's just an instrument that does whatever is in here, which is also why your mouth is called an instrument of praise, because what is in here will then come out of here. So if, when mankind will look at it and say, fix this. Stop saying that thing. Stop doing that thing. Stop, 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 stop. But what God says is bury some new treasure in there. It will take time, but it will grow. And when it grows, we'll see something new come out of it. We'll see this new fruit, and then we'll know. See, religion and this works idea tries to say, basically obtain fruit before you attain a tree. Show us the fruit that you are this thing, and then be planted. And that doesn't work in the natural. Why would we think that works spiritually? Spiritually, it says you're going to plant this thing. It doesn't even look like it. And again, James is going to help me out. He, he, he agreed. Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't plant things. I, I, it's not a thing for me. Um, but my wife has. She's had some gardens here and there, you know. And my son decided one day at peaches, we love peaches in our house, after he ate a peach, that he was going to grow a peach tree with that pit. So he goes out there and bears it. This is Levi. Literally, this was, he was a little younger. Later that day, he goes outside. He did this for a week, guys. And then he finally realized, it ain't going to happen. I showed him a time lapse where they were showing a tree growing. And it was showing how long. And they literally did a time lapse of like a year. And it wasn't a peach tree, it was some other tree. Of this tree growing. You know, and see, this is what it means, treasure. It, when you start the process, it's not going to look like anything changes. <laughs> but what Scripture calls us to be is holy and dedicated, meaning every day you water it and make sure. You, you don't dig back up the treasure. You just leave it there and say, I'm just going to keep watering it. What is the Spirit called? Water. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. And then one day we may see a little boink, twig. And then inevitably someone's going to come mow it down. And you've got to start all over again. Yes, <laughs> that is. And this is what the scripture is saying. Man will tell you, fix the mouth, fix the issue, fix it, fix it, fix it, Felix. And then you'll begin to grow into a great Christian or whatever. And then you'll be like Christ. No, it's the exact reverse. 
Get to the face of God. Seek him. And when you put that, put that in there and you keep water, it will take some time, but eventually... And then how does he tie it back for us? Look at Jesus go. So why do you say I'm Lord? Because the word Lord here is a title. It's not like a name. So we, we say the Lord, right? And what we're meaning by that, the word Lord, right? Think, think medieval. Medieval. What, what does it mean? It's a title given to someone. That title to someone is someone who, thinks about this, think about this, think about this, think about this, who owns property. Specifically, in, in, in Old English time, you were a lord by title if you owned some land. What is the analogy? Who, what is land, guys? Everywhere in Scripture, what is land? What, what, is, what is the dirt? It's you. <laughs> the idea of saying lord is to say, I, I, I'm your servant, right? Okay, but we use that so frivolously. No, the, I am your property, I am your ground to do with what you please, to plant what you want to plant, to tear up what you want to tear up. That's what I am. To build what you want to build. See, because the Lord doesn't ask the tenants of land what he can and cannot do with his land. And you're the land, remember. We don't like that. So this word Lord here is a title given saying, you're the owner of the property, this thing. It's almost like, because Paul says it this way. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with the price. See, but we like to, oh, I'm serving the Lord. No, you're not. You're bearing your own treasure. You're deciding what happens with the land, with the life that you have. But he says here, why do you call me Lord? Why do you say that, 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 that I'm the owner of this? Why do you say that you're the servant of me? Why do you say, but you're not doing what I told you to do. And you can't get really much more clear than that. And just for fun, just because I'm having fun. And I finished like pretty well. There's other scriptures that say, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things in your name, which means like your authority? He says, I didn't know you. No, didn't know you. I mean, I didn't, I didn't perceive and didn't understand. I, didn't, I, I did not have a relationship with you because you were not mine. Ooh, I almost spilled that. So why do you not do what I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my saying, and does them, I'll show you who he's like. And then he gives us this idea of building a house. He goes from direct ideas of saying forgiveness and giving. He talks about trees, and he talks about building. And, and before that, he's talking about being blind. He will use anything to get you to understand this one thing. And the one thing is a process of the evidence. That comes later. But the first thing comes is a repair with him. This is why so much of, of, of Christianity, just let me help you guys out with some things, because sometimes we think that what we hear here maybe or other places is like new information, and largely it's not. It's just represented differently in a way that now we understand. Why do you think that Christianity for the last give or take, I don't know, two millennia, so 2,000 years, has been centered and fixated on this general idea of you're pretty messed up. <laughs> you need Jesus. And the only way to get that is to repent, which means to change and go the other way. And then by so doing, you're what? Saved. The word saved to me, complete, made whole, rescued. From what? From the death, chaos, and destruction, but it requires you to put a good treasure in your heart. And what is the treasure that Jesus says? Seek first the kingdom of God. Then all the things get added. We're going to talk about that one because that was a fun one too. It's simple. It's difficult, but simple. Now, again, I have to say this. I have to preface this because I feel like with this 
really it's a false dichotomy that happens in, in this idea of faith and works and faith and works and all this stuff. Don't mistake and think that I'm saying that you have to work to earn salvation. That is anti-scriptural. Not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that to be converted is how Paul puts it. To be transformed, this is what's required. To be a part of the kingdom, this is what's required. And there's a difference in the two things. And I know that kind of juggles with our theologies a little bit. We will get to it to help understand it more. It's really not all that complicated. Sometimes we make it that way. So do not conflate that I'm saying, well, if you work hard enough and you do, then, then if there's a good enough tree and fruit, then, then you'll be saved. That's not what I'm saying. Which first off, you're already jumping to eternity, and I'm talking about here and now. I'm talking about being Christ to the world here and now. So you're already talking about a question I'm not presenting at the moment. <laughs> so do not mistake that because it's very easy for us to walk out of here and think like, oh, I'm not doing good enough. And we walk into shame very quickly. And that, that, that is the furthest thing from the Spirit of God that there is. You want to know how I know? Genesis tells us that because what's the first thing man does when he introduces death, chaos, and destruction into the world? He covers himself up. That is shame. And that is not the case. So don't take it that way. Take it as this is the evidence to know where I'm at in my heart. And see, when you look at it that way, you begin to see the growth because you see the little twig pop up. And even if it does not apparent because maybe you have been injured and hurt in life and those types of things, you still know the seeds there and you just want to see it grow. And so your entire focus stays shifted. I don't know where I got on the mower cutting down weeds, uh, but... It works. It's a good analogy. <laughs> Are we getting this? I just want to be clear with that every week as we go through this, uh, this particular portion of the text, because Jesus talks a lot about this idea of hearing and doing. Um, don't, mistake, uh, don't mistake it for that. We will continue to discuss this, and if you need immediate answers, like after uh, this session, I'm more than happy to answer some of them. Um, so we just we must not take it that way. Uh, so next week... Well, Sunday, we will continue on with some parables. Um, And then next week, Wednesday, we're going to basically take this, because now we've looked at everything Luke had to say about this particular sermon. We're going to flip and look at what else Matthew had to say, because Matthew adds some things in here that Luke doesn't talk about specifically. Same general concepts and ideas, but he he, he approaches some other thoughts as well. Um, He goes, I mean, Matthew just goes on a a rant, or Jesus does through Matthew, (laughs) because, I mean, we're going to end up talking about all of this stuff, plus we're going to talk about divorce. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. It's all in there. Um, And so as we go through that, we'll look at what Matthew says, and then that, that may take us one or two weeks. And then we'll continue on to the next event that happens. Um, So guys, right now we're setting at like, uh, once we finish Matthew, we'll be at like 30 some odd percent done of the words of Christ. We're only at like 30 (laughs) percent. So we've got a long long way to go still. Um, But I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying it myself. I hope you guys are. And I hope it's illuminating and, and, and energizing you.